in the service. Now continue with the sermon. That sermon is based on our reading from Ezekiel chapter 2 through Ezekiel chapter 3 verse 4. You can follow along at home in your Bible or you can follow along here as it's printed for you in your worship folder. We'll begin with this prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. The president of Haiti was just assassinated. Not all the details are out yet. One thing is clear, though. There is a rebellion there. There's a rebellion, there's a group of people that were fine with the current leadership, but there is another group that was not fine with the establishment. And so they rebelled. Rebellion surrounds us in this world. It's not just on large scales, and it doesn't always end in the taking of life. It even affects us in our homes. Rebellion occurs when you put vegetables in front of the little ones. They take them and they throw them on the ground. They don't like vegetables. They see a different reality than mom and dad. And often you can define rebellion as just that. Two groups or two people that see reality in two different ways. Came across a story this week of an American writer. I had not heard of him before. His name is Kurt Vonnegut. Maybe you know him, maybe you don't. I don't know. But he told a story about when he was young. He was a teenager. He was on an archaeological dig. He was only 15, so it's kind of cool to be 15 at an archaeological dig. He was talking, talking with one of the archaeologists, and the archaeologist was trying to get to know him and asking those typical questions, something like, where are you from? What sports do you play? And when he asked him that particular question, Vonnegut responded, didn't play any sports. I do theater, I do choir, and I can play the piano and the violin. Now to that, the archaeologist said, wow, that's, that's amazing. But Vonnegut, he quickly followed up and said, ah, but I'm not, I'm not good at any of those things. And the archaeologist looked at him and he said, it's not about being good at things in life that makes somebody interesting, but he said, I have found that it's all the different experiences that somebody has in life that is really what makes them interesting. And apparently that stuck with Vonnegut throughout his life. It was a life-changing moment for him. He had been raised in a culture, in a society, a home, where it was all achievement-oriented and was only worth doing something if you were going to win at it. And what that archaeologist said to him, it totally changed uh, the way he viewed life, and he started to do things simply because he enjoyed doing things. He became a rebel then. He didn't follow in with that way of looking at reality, that it's only worth doing something if you can be the best, if you can achieve great things in it, and he started doing things, again, simply because he enjoyed doing them, he enjoyed a new experience. As Jesus traveled around, he finally came to his hometown, and he encountered these two groups, two different views of reality. We read in Mark chapter 6, When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. The people of his hometown couldn't, couldn't believe it. His depth of insight, his wisdom, even the miracles that he performed. Again, they had known him since he was just a little guy, and they saw him be the carpenter. They knew he was Mary's son, and they said, Jesus, your brothers and sisters, they're, they're still here. And so they were offended. Offended that Jesus came to town as if he was some big shot. He was better than all of them. And so they took offense at his teachings, at his wisdom, even his miracles. 
And Jesus says this about his hometown. He said, A prophet is not without honor except in his own hometown, among his relatives, his own home. We read he could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed at their lack of faith. The people of Jesus' own hometown completely missed who he was. The people that knew him best, people that were also familiar with Scripture, they were offended at his teachings, at his miracles. Their view of reality had no room in it for somebody that looked just like them to claim to be the Savior. Their hearts were rebellious and filled with sin. They did not recognize their Savior by faith. The prophet Ezekiel was called to a similarly rebellious people. The prophet Ezekiel served Israel during their exile. This is after the Babylonians had come in and overtaken Israel. And it took a few different times, but he was in one of the waves of exiles taken into captivity. And while they were in captivity, that was his entire ministry. And his ministry could be summed up in two parts, really. Again, he had been taken there before the complete downfall of Jerusalem and the temple. And so the first part of his ministry, the first part of uh, the prophet Ezekiel's book, is a call to Israel to stop rebelling against God. If they continued in their sin, if they continued to go against God, he would allow them to finally be crushed. It was a call to repentance, Second half of Ezekiel's message was a result of the people, again, not listening to God. And so he allowed Jerusalem, the capital city of Israel, of Judah, of God's people, was crushed, leveled, destroyed. Even God's temple that was there was destroyed and ransacked. Their identity as a people was gone and destroyed. The rebels had won against God, and it seemed like God was powerless And so, the second half of the message was a promise of deliverance. The wall seems lost. God is still for you, Israel, and he will deliver you. And there's a series of promises of destruction for all of the nations that had attacked Israel. So God would deliver his people, and he would exact his justice on those that had hurt their people. As Ezekiel was being commissioned to become a prophet, he gets a vision from God. We hear this about the vision recorded in Ezekiel chapter 2. Then I looked, and I saw a hand stretched out to me. In it was a scroll, which he unrolled before me. On both sides of it were written words of lament and mourning and woe. The scroll that God was giving to the prophet Ezekiel was the message. It symbolized the message Ezekiel was to bring to the people of Israel. The reason it had laments and mourning and woes was because part of that message would be showing the people their clear sin, their wickedness and rebellion against God. It wouldn't be words that they were eager to have the prophet speak to them. And as with the people in Jesus' hometown, they didn't want to hear another man call them out, even if his words were from God. Who was Ezekiel to come to them and show them their sin? And you and I have the exact same rebellious hearts. True rebels, I think, really don't want to be known as rebels. Rebels fight for a cause. They fight for their view of reality, the truth as they see it. I think many rebels then would probably call whatever the establishment is them. They are the rebels. They are the ones that are going against what reality should be. They are the ones that are going against the truth. And either way, that really gets at the heart of what rebellion is. It's seeing my way as what's true. And if somebody else goes against it, well, They need to be rebelled against because I know what's right. They don't. 
That little rebel lives inside of all of us. It is our sinful nature that doesn't want anybody to tell us that what we're doing is wrong. It doesn't want anybody telling us to do what's wrong, even if we come to them with God's word. We still don't want to hear it. We don't want to be accused that we are living our lives in pursuit of making more money or in pursuit of getting more likes or more acceptance by others. We don't want to hear that little things like maybe our way of washing the dishes or our way of making the bed. Those are just little things. But up to the way that we parent or our political views may not be the most loving thing toward our spouse or our friends or our community or real love towards God. We don't like being challenged. We don't like being wrong. We don't like being called out. Or perhaps you're not like that. Perhaps you're the complete opposite and you welcome it when somebody calls you out for doing something that is wrong and sinful and you are so eager to say, yes, I have failed. I have failed you and I have failed God. And then in that deep sense of humility, you have become shy and you have become someone that doesn't want to call others out for their wrongdoing. You're too humble. You're so unwilling to have any kind of a confrontation, even if God's word is backing you up, even if you want to do it in love. You are unwilling to share God's word with others because they might reject you for a time or for forever, and you might lose that relationship, and so you do not share God's word. God has words of encouragement when you worry about that kind of rejection. God encouraged Ezekiel when he faced rejection. He said, And you, son of man, do not be afraid of them or their words. Do not be afraid. Though briars and thorns are all around you and you live among scorpions, this would be a description of just life being difficult for Ezekiel as, a, as he lived among a rebellious people that did not want to hear the word of God which is a similar situation that all of us live in. Do not be afraid of what they say, or be terrified of them, though they are a rebellious people. You must, you must speak my words to them, whether they listen or fail to listen. You must speak my words, whether they listen or fail to listen, for they are rebellious. Whether it's your stubborn, rebellious, obstinate heart that doesn't want to hear God's word, or it's that heart in another person that you're talking to, we all share the same sinful hearts. And God's desire is that his message reaches all of us. Regardless of whether it is listened to or not, his desire is that his word would be shared, preached, taught, texted, tweeted, snapped, whatever you got. There's always a new thing. He wants you to share his word, and he wants you to hear his word. Because God does not treat rebellion as we expect. We would expect God to treat rebellion like we treat rebellion. You fight against it. You seek it out. You crush it. You punish. God doesn't act like that. As we rebel against God, God does seek us out, but not to crush us. He seeks us out to fight for us, to forgive us. The ugliness of your rebellion against God that is visible when you read God's Word. When God's Word brings to light all of your sins, this is God's goal, that you would see also His forgiveness. Not that you would be left destroyed and hopeless, but that you would be built up in Him. The scroll that pictured the message Isaiah or Ezekiel was to bring to his people, yes, had words of lament and mourning and woe, but God told Ezekiel to eat it, 
to eat this unappetizing message, to make it part of himself, just like when you eat food, it becomes a part of you. He said, eat this. Son of man, eat what is before you. Eat this scroll. Then go speak to the people. So I opened my mouth, and he gave me the scroll to eat. Then he said to me, Son of man, eat this scroll I am giving you, and fill your stomach with it. So I ate it, and it tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth. It became sweet. A scroll that on the front and the back, its entirety looked like lament and woe, words that were going to hurt and crush and destroy people, words that people did not want to hear, unappetizing words. God told Ezekiel to eat it. He tells him to eat it twice, and finally he does, and it turns to sweet honey in his mouth. Yes, he was going to a rebellious people, but God wanted him to eat This would be good for the people to hear. It would be good for them to recognize how terrible their sin is so that they would see their lost cause and their need for God alone to be their Savior. And so it is the same with us. We need to be confronted with how terrible our sin and rebellion against God is. Only then do we see how much we need our Savior and how completely he has saved all of us. God's message for you in the sinful world is that He has saved you, He will take you to heaven, and so your loyalty is to Him as your Lord. Your loyalty is not to the rebellion being led by the devil. Your loyalty is to God, because God has saved you from that rebellion. God told Ezekiel, but you, son of man, you, Ezekiel, Listen to what I say to you. Do not rebel like that rebellious people. Open your mouth and eat what I give you. Yes, the message for the prophet Ezekiel was for the entire nation of Israel. It was a specific and unique call, something that most of us do not have. But notice here, God said, this message is also personal for you, Ezekiel. Ezekiel, you, my dear child, take this to heart. Do not be lost in the rebellion. Do not get lost in sin. Do not reject me. Open your mouth and eat the good things I have prepared for you. And the same is true for all of you. God says to each and every one of you, do not get lost in sin. Do not get lost in loveless hearts. Do not get lost in this world so that you stop hearing the word of God so that you stop planning for personal devotional time in God's Word in your life, that you stop going to Bible study, that you stop going to worship. Don't do that. Instead, eat my Word, my Word that is good and sweet as honey. It's funny here, there's a description of that scroll. It's got those three difficult words that we struggle with. Lament and mourning and woe, and then just that one descriptor, sweet as honey. And so here are some other good descriptions of all of the sweet promises that God has made for you. When you were held captive by sin, enslaved by sin, God paid the price that you would be free. When your death was demanded of you by God to pay for your sins, Jesus redeemed you. In other words, he bought you back with his own blood, with his own life. When God was so angry with you for failing him over and over again, even as his dear child, all of that wrath and anger and disappointment was poured out onto Jesus so that God now looks at you as his good, dear child. And he is pleased with everything that you do because of Jesus. When you stood before God as a judge, and you were confident that his verdict against you would be sinner, condemned to hell. Jesus stood between you and God and said, No, it is my life that you look at when you look at them. You now see them as righteous, good, perfect, worthy of entrance into your heaven, God. And so God's verdict for you is that you are good. You have been declared not guilty because of what Jesus 
has done for you. When you were part of this rebellious world, the Holy Spirit, God himself, came into your heart and convinced you, gave you the gift of faith to trust in God alone. And he also then gave you that heart that loves to serve God and others, that loves to do good works out of thankfulness. When your sins cling to you like Texas mud after a big old rain, and you can never get that mud off ever, no matter how long I've done it, and it gets in your boots, and it drives you crazy, when your sins do that, when you say, I have tried to wash this sin out of my life time and time again, God says to you, I have washed you clean, son and daughter, through the waters of your baptism, and I have clothed you head to boot with Jesus, white robe of his righteousness, of his holiness. When you feel alone and abandoned, like nobody else in your life really understands what you're going through, when it seems like people don't even see worth in you as a person, Jesus says, you are my friend. And when your family even gives up on you, Jesus says, you are my brother and my sister. When sickness and death come at you with the fear and that overpowering that you just stand there and you can't even comprehend death. Jesus died for you and he rose to guarantee that you will be raised to life, to have an indestructible eternal life with him in heaven. When you feel the need to give back to God because of the things that you've done wrong in your life that you need to somehow equalize, that way God has nothing to hold against you, when you stand before him, that's when God says, I have forgiven you. I have forgiven. I have given up my right as God to hold anything against you in your life. Because I held it all against Jesus. You are forgiven. You are set free. There is no fear. There is only love between us. When the devil accuses you as being an enemy of God, God says, no, I have reconciled. I have made peace between me and you. We now are at harmony. You are on my side, filled with the Holy Spirit. When you were born to sinful parents, you were reborn by the power of the Holy Spirit and given life. When you are stubborn, God still loves you. When you are rebellious, God still loves you. When you walk in darkness, He shines his light on you and in you and through you. That is why the scroll was sweet in Ezekiel's mouth. Because of God's countless promises for sinful, rebellious people. That he has taken care of everything that you fear and everything that threatens you, it is gone. That is the great deliverance of your God. This is what God wants you to hear. And it is why in Paul's second letter to Timothy in chapter 3, he gives Timothy this wonderful encouragement to remain in the Scriptures. And the encouragement really goes beyond. It could be you could put your name into this letter. This encouragement to be in the Word is true for all of us. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of because you know from whom you learned it. And how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is God-breathed. It is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. All of God's Word is meant for you. All of it. So that you will be thoroughly convinced that Jesus Christ is your Savior, that He has saved you from all of your sin and rebellion, that you are good and righteous in God's eyes, that heaven is open to you, that you will be brought back to life from the dead and you will live with God in heaven forever. Rebellion is all around us. It's in our own country. It happens when your kids get the vegetables in front of them, and they take them and they throw them on the floor. 
We hear about it in other countries, even as presidents are assassinated. Rebellion surrounds us in life. And the amazing truth of Scripture is that the one that we were all rebelling against gave his life to save us. The one who was rebelled against died to save the rebels, to bring them back onto his cause. Ezekiel was called to a people that had come about as far as you can go in their rebellion against God, to have rebelled against him century after century, generation after generation, to the point where God allowed his own people to be destroyed and taken to a different country, and his own temple, where God would meet with the people to be destroyed. And God would not give up on them. Ezekiel, go to my people. Call them to repentance. Remind them of my deliverance. Let them know I will fight for them and destroy those other nations that have attacked them. It is the same God that has fought for you. When you were afraid that standing before God would mean you flat on your face, worried that he would punish you, God brought you up onto your feet, he opened your mouth, and he has fed you with good things. You're free from this achievement-oriented view of a relationship with God where you need to do good, and then that'll win God's favor. You are good because of Jesus. That is great comfort because that doesn't change. That has been done for you. And so now you get to live a life of enjoyment. Enjoyment as God's word is before you and you get to eat of it. And that's what keeps you alive every day and confident of your home in heaven. Eat what God gives you and share it with others. Even if sometimes they throw it on the floor. Because what God gives you to eat is good. It's Jesus. Amen.